All right, welcome back to the Jay Martin Show. My name is Jay Martin. And I'm joined right now by Milton Berg. Milton, how are you? It's great to have you on the show. Good, nice meeting you. Likewise. Okay, now um, let's start right here. What uh, what macro themes are catching your attention right now? It seems like everywhere we look, the sky is falling to a degree. There's chaos and volatility everywhere. What are you most focused on right now, Milton? Well, number one, China. China had a bear market. I mean, you look at the MCHI ETF, down 61%. 61% is an extreme bear market. It actually moved along with the U.S. equities. It peaked on uh, roughly uh, February 16th or 17th, 2021, which was one day before after the ARKK, the ARK ETF peaked. So mm -hmm. the Chinese markets are moving along with us, the speculative part of our markets. But the Chinese markets are the at least the MCHI ETF are far better companies than the ARKK, which are very, very speculative. And anyway, the 61% beer market tells me start looking for a bottom. Uh, we do our work based on mostly technical analysis and some esoteric type of analysis. There was a, uh, a report written up for uh, actually won an award, the, the Dow Jones. Um, uh, they have an award once a year. The CMT has an award for the best technical piece. And uh, a fellow named Chris Carolyn discovered what he called the spiral calendar. He called the autumn panic is a date in, in usually in October, which markets that are crashing make the final bottom. MCHI made it the bottom exactly that day, intraday, down 61%. We got long that day. And we believe China is, uh, whether or not they, you can make, make, can make, make many negative arguments about the Chinese economy or the Chinese market, but most of it is already in the price of the index is down 61%. So we're long China uh, for the intermediate term, you know, probably for a year or longer. We think China is a place to be invested in. Secondly, we believe that the United States st stock market has not had its final bull market high. In other words, you, as you in your introduction, you suggested that though they were, we're in this sort of a crisis now, people are very troubled. I think this is just the first leg of a bear market. I think we're going to make, I mean, the decline into last June, which was the, which was the low, or the internal low. Uh, the market uh, was up some, seven, the S&P was up some 17% over its June low, came back down, tested the June low, now up some 14, 15%. But we think the market will make new highs uh, sometime in the first half of next year. And... Um, whether that'll be the final high of the great bull market that began in, in, in the year, uh, uh, um, say, 1980, 1982 or 2000, whenever you want to look at the start, we don't know. But we just think, we think there's more to the upside in the stock market. So we're bullish on United States stocks. We're bullish on Chinese stocks, uh, at least this is for the intermediate term, you know, going out into next year. And that's, that's probably my main macro theme. Now, what would a catalyst be? Would it be a pivot, uh, a rate pivot? What would a catalyst be? It would drive the U.S. equities to all-time highs. It's interesting you yes, asked about a catalyst. One of the problems, mistakes most investors make, particularly retail investors, is they don't want to invest until things look good, until they have a catalyst. I don't know what the catalyst will be. I have two choices. The catalyst either might be that the Fed has not tightened enough, because let's see, listen, they had, they had a decade, more than a decade of monetary loosening. They've only been tightening for about six months or so. Maybe they don't tighten enough. They, they, they stop tightening, or they even continue tightening. But maybe the, the economy isn't as tight as we think it is, and we have an inflationary boom, boom and the market continues higher for that reason. Or maybe they're successful and generate a, 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 a soft landing. But for me, the catalyst is the market itself. We look at what you call our own market indicators. We've developed many over the years. And the market indicators, as we see, it tells us, there's panic selling into June 16th. The Russell 2000 bottom on June 16th has not made a, no, a lower low since then. We're now December 14th, from June 16th to December 14th. Despite the fact that rates have gone up, despite the fact that the Fed has been tightening, despite the fact that people are talking about uh, inflation, deflation or, de or, or economic um, recession, other people talk about depression, despite all this talk, the Russell has held its June 16th lows. And the S&P has only gone less than 3% below June 16th lows in a test. So we think there was a sharp, short bear market and the basic in June. A lot of churning since then. We call churning at the low. The next move will be the upside. It'd be very surprising to most of the negative pundits out there. And maybe, maybe the next peak sometime next year will be the final peak in this bear market before the so-called depression and recession crash comes. We don't see it happening now at all. But you do you do see it occurring now. I you see well, it. I, I this is what I see. There's really really two scenarios. Everybody knows, or you, uh, uh, many people state that our economy is not a very clean and not very free and not very clear economy. There's, there's too much debt outstanding. You have the future of the economy in the hands of a bunch of PhDs who work for the Federal Reserve who really have no clue about the working man. You have you have a Congress 
run by you know, lawmakers rather than by, by economists. So policies are wrong, monetary conditions are wrong, but we don't know what the result could be. The result might be hyperinflation like you had in Germany in the 1920s, which might, with therefore tells you on gold, on stocks, on assets, or you may get the depressionary decline like you had in the United States in the 1930s, which tells you get out of, get out of stocks, get out of assets, and hold the cash equivalents. We don't know the answer. At this point, our indicators are telling us to be long the stock market, to be long gold, to be long the Chinese equities, which would suggest possibly that there's still inflationary moves ahead of us. But we'd rather not predict what, uh, what the fundamentals would be. We'd rather have the market tell us where to be invested. I can always make a case, I can always make a bullish case or bearish case about the economy. I can do it any day of the year. I've been in the business for 40 years. And any given day, I can give a bullish case or a bearish case. And I can make a convincing bullish case or convincing bearish case. But what, therefore, what we, we focus on is the market itself. We have thousands of indicators that we use. And as I state, it's surprising when I tell people that the Russell 2000 has not made a lower low than the June 16th low, while the headlines are recession, depression, inflation, monetary tightening, and so on and so forth. Okay. Okay. And I like that <clears throat> sort of nonpartisan viewpoint of the American economy. I agree with you. 365 days of the year, you could make a sound argument and a convincing one that things are going to get better or worse. Um, at this point, do you have any opinion on the on the US dollar rally? This has been, you know, a safe haven for the world, right? We've piled into this trade. It's now the most overcrowded trade in the yeah. world. And do you think this rally is about to roll over? Well, certainly for the short term, I think I think dollar has rolled over. I think dollar had made its peak. I think it was peak sometime late October. The dollar peaked. We we went uh, we didn't go short the dollar. We did get long. We did go long gold and long gold stocks at the time. Uh, it, this is not a long term. Long term, the dollar is not a place to hold keep your money. The dollar is worth a penny or two cents. What it's worth a hundred hundred years ago. A dollar is not some place to park your money. A dollar is a place to park your money when you're anticipating waiting for something else to invest it. So we think that 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 that, that took place for the last uh, you know last year or so, where the dollar was in a nice tear up to the upside. We think the dollar has now peaked. We think the dollar should decline, and the investors should not park the money in dollars. On the other hand, there is some uh, short-term instruments that give you nice returns of four or five percent or six percent. It might make sense to park your money for 90 days, 60 days, or one year in, into dollar instruments strictly to get the interest. But the uh, dollar is never a long-term investment. You know, once once a dollar and gold were, were once the dollar backing of gold was separated, a, gold, a dollar is no longer a place to, to park your money over the long term. But answering your question, we were bullish on the dollar. We're now bearish on the dollar. We'd rather be in, in, in assets like gold or equities rather than the dollar at this time. So when you say gold or equities, do you look as well at gold equities or, you know, do you look at the drivers of the last few bull market peaks and expect them to perform similarly? Well, the, no, I think I think the uh, the uh, drivers of the last bull market, the technology stocks, basically uh, have had the ha, had the great run. I mean, everybody owns an iPhone, and everybody everybody uh, who, who, who travels knows how to use Uber, and everybody you know you have you have you have a, a proliferation of, of 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 technology. So you're not going to make money strictly throwing darts at technology stocks. There will be some great companies that come up with some innovations and some ideas that take market share from other companies. But I think basically there's a, bit, a large saturation in, in the technology area. Probably the place to make money will be non-technology, maybe maybe some retailers, maybe um, oil and so on. But um, you know, we we not really, really I really rather give the mark the macro view than to uh, name specific stocks. But in every bull market, there are stocks that are leading, and the way to do it is you look at the relative strength. You, you use the type of thing that William O'Neill suggests, uh, you know, relative strength stocks, companies have a new innovation and so on. But no, I think generally technology, I think, had its great move. And now there's, there'll be probably some other group that has that has a move other than technology. Although within the technology area, there will be some companies that have some great innovation able to take market share. We, I just can't tell you at this point exactly who they are. And do you look at gold equities? Yes, we have a, a position in gold equities. Uh, we actually uh, know that gold equities generally do well when the stock market bottoms. In other words, a bull market in stocks usually are accompanied by bull markets in gold stocks. And uh, however, over the long term, believe it or not, uh, most people don't see the studies. We've done studies on this. Over the long term, you're better off holding gold than gold equities because there's a basic flaw in gold equities. In gold, gold, gold companies, basic flaw. You have a company that ha found a great mine and they're mining the gold and they're selling it. The more successful they are, the more of their reserves are depleted. So unless they're able to find, make another great find of gold, um, they really not gonna. They, it's, it's really not gonna be that great. So historically, if you look at the index of the gold stocks historically, going back, I'd say uh, I have it going back uh, probably 50 years. 
you'd be better buying gold and holding than buying gold stocks and holding. Although, of course, gold stocks be far more volatile. If you're a trader, you want to buy the gold stocks. For example, now we own gold stocks because gold stocks have declined far more than gold have into this latest low. And we think the latest low in gold or the latest rally in gold will be accompanied by a rally in gold stocks. But over the longer term, if you could buy gold at the low or you buy gold stocks at the low over the long term, I'm talking about 20, 30, 40 years out, you better off only the gold and only the gold stocks. That, that, at least that has been the situation historically. But for the volatile, for the trader, for the volatility, if you catch the lows and you catch the move, you're much better off in gold stocks than in gold itself. We actually need to have a damn good recession. <laughs>yeah okay i completely agree with that now do you, expanding outside of the gold market staying with the metals do you, are you looking at the base metal equities uh you know those which will power any kind of renewable energy transition if you're putting weight on that thread copper nickel and the like well with that i i don't do i don't, I don't trade commodities per se gold is sort of an instrument that even the equity people look at so and I actually ran, once ran one of the largest gold funds in America. So we we invest in gold. I think um, commodities in general, if you, if you look at the history of commodities going back to 1980, not one of the major commodities that were that, that peaked in 1980, that inflationary boom, on a real base, an inflationary adjusted base, have made new highs, have made new highs into 2022. I can give you some examples. I'm actually scrolling through some charts here, if you don't mind. Um, you can't tell that I'm doing that, but I'm looking, I'm going to give you some examples. Uh, and I'll be there in a moment. Uh, let's get this commodity. First of the Reuters commodity, com continuous commodity index peaked in 1974 at a level of 4.5. It's now at a level of 2.8. So, you know, you're talking from 1974 until 2022. This is on, a, this is on an inflation, inflation adjusted basis, uh, basis relative to CPI. But I actually have some particular commodities. Give me an example. Corn, corn futures peaked in 1982. They've never made it a higher high on an inflation adjusted basis. I see the only commodity I could find that made a higher high was oats. Orange juice futures are far on an inflation adjusted basis are far lower than they were in 1980. Uh, sugar had a major cyclical peak in 1980 and never made it never made a higher high. Uh, coffee futures, same story, had its peak in 19, uh, 1981 and never made a higher high. So I'm not a, a I'm not a believer in a, in, in long term in owning commodities for the long term. Again, you want to own them for a cycle. Commodities have already, already had a nice, a nice strong move over the last two years. I don't think commodities in general is a place to invest at this point. Stocks which have declined dramatically and with expectations are very, very low in stocks and in equities. And for example, Chinese stocks in particular, where expectations are very low. That's really where you'd want to be at this time. It's not suggesting that commodities aren't going to move up you know, if, if inflation continues. But I think the safest bet and the most likely bet is to invest in, in equities uh, at, at this time rather rather to invest in, in commodities. That, that's, that's the argument. Okay. No, that sounds interesting. Now, then coming back to Chinese equities, what sort of implications do you think you know, China's reopening will have on those companies? Do you expect this to be a bit of a surge? in um in productivity well chinese china we talk about productivity in china i mean productivity in china is amazing relative to productivity in, in the rest of the world i mean i don't know if you've seen the videos of how they built those hospitals when covid first started you know within eight days they built hospitals with all the, with all the beds with all the plumbing i mean it's unbelievable Whatever you see how i mean you can find it on youtube you, when, but they have to build a bridge you know for us you have to go through all these you know it's, it's a it's a dictatorship so you don't have to go through all the bureaucracy to get yeah. something done so we, in the fact that it's a dictatorship is not beneficial for for the companies you know because uh generally dictatorships don't have great economies but somehow china has managed somehow at least until now to have a run run by a so-called communist government but the uh, generally, the, when people start companies in a, in a very capitalistic manner, I think the taxes are forty percent. Some 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 people here pay far greater taxes than they pay in China. So I think China really is a good bet. Can I guarantee that China will be great for the next twenty years? I certainly can't. But I certainly go, would say that considering that the Chinese stock market is down sixty percent, considering some of the most innovative companies, um, or well, let's say let's say some of the most innovative copycat companies are in China, and the fact that China has over a billion people and all these people are coming out of poverty into, into a middle class, I think China is a great, is a great investment at this time. Whether, the, whether or not the, um, the fact that they're going to make change in the COVID policy, whether that's important or not, it, it's possible. But again, if I make my decisions based on 
the fundamentals are going to make mistakes because there's so many different ways to interpret fundamentals. If you're going to make the make the decision based on the actions of the of the, of the asset itself, and based on the historical probabilities of how the asset will continue continue performing based on on its action, uh, then it's a safe bet. So again, China down 61 percent. Um, it bottomed on, on a cyclical, a very important cyclical day. The Chinese government last March, I think March 15th, said they're going to protect the companies. They have been lowering rates. They, they're, so I, I think China is a very good bet. I, as far as fundamentals, and I visited China a number of times. People are still afraid to speak the truth. People feel I'm not. I'm not I don't want the Chinese people to get my address here, but you know, I think I think it is still an oppressive government. But maybe they'll be turning slightly less oppressive over the next few years. Maybe that'll be beneficial for the companies and beneficial for for the equities. But I do think China is a, is a good good investment this time. People say, well, Chinese equities are forty percent in less than a month, which is well, in a month and a half, it's up forty percent. That's true. But you know, China is still a, a uh, is still a, a significant place to go just to make its previous highs. And again, China is still a growing economy. Growth may have slowed, but it's still a growing economy. They don't have negative GDPs like we have in, in recessions. They have a slowdown in GDP when they have their recessions. Yeah, okay. Now, have you allocated or are you allocating any cash to the energy sector? And if so, where are you looking? We just went, went long energy just in the last uh, last 10 days. We went. Uh, we recommended our clients get long the, 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 the crude future. But basically, this is, a, this is a trade. Pessimism in the energy sector is rampant at this point. Um, on an inflation-adjusted basis, um, the price of oil is far below where it was years ago, and we think that uh, energy still drives the economy. We don't believe that solar, or we don't believe that uh, um, you know, is going to take the place of of uh, of, uh, of of a crude crude product, a natural resource product. We just think it's a fantasy. You can take a small portion of it, but not a, not a large portion of it. So we think the uh, there's a future. In the energy business and the search of future in these stocks, these stocks rallied sharply, came down, a lot of pessimism, and we still think the bull market is more to more, more, more to run in oil. These are oil, um, oil, oil itself, not the oil equities. The oil equities peaked. I'm not so sure they've they've uh, and they've they've come down. I'm not sure they're at a low, but I think the price of oil itself should be at a tradable low at this point. And again, these are tradable lows. Early in the in the in the interview when I spoke about Chinese equities or U.S. equities, I talked more for intermediate term into late 2023. When I talk about a trade in oil, it may, you know, it may just be a 20% move over, over over two or three months rather than a longer term move. I, I we really can't, can't tell at this time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Milton, look, I appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the show, for chatting with me and okay. uh, letting my audience know what you're up to. Great. Thank you. Nice talking to you. We actually need to have a damn good recession. The Russian economy is a gas station run by the mafia. $41 trillion has been created out of nothing. There's a stranglehold in China on most of these resources. The outlook and fundamentals for the metals remains very, very strong.